Hi everyone, and welcome to our new pro to our new academic year and to the program for conflict research management and resolution and to the pro new program, new MA program in gender and diversity studies. This is a joint opening of the year seminar of both programs. Uh, welcome and good luck to all of us. We hope we will have a good academic year in spite of all the complexities. And we hope that before the end of the year, we'll get to see each other in real life. Um, we have today um, greetings to Reut Israeli, our dear coordinator who gave birth to a baby son. So uh, Mazal Tov to Reut. And today with us is our new coordinator for the, while uh, Reut will be on leave, which is Lior Levin, she's today with us. If you need the contact information, write and we'll give you. Uh, we're honored to, hi, okay, here she is, okay. Hi and welcome and good luck. And you're already working with us, but some people uh, don't know you yet. So welcome and uh, Lior is now the, of course, all of us and Lior is the address to any questions uh, you have. And if you need the contact information, please write and we'll give it to you. Uh, for our opening event of the conflict program and the new gender and diversity MA program, we are honored and glad to have advocate Neta Levy from uh, Ma'aki that will lecture on a topic and intervention, intervention that are of high significance for both conflict resolution and gender and diversity studies. Uh, I was asked to tell you that this event will be broadcast on Facebook Live on, of Itach Ma'aki, the organization that we're hosting today. Uh, we, the broadcast will show only people that are speaking. So if you're not speaking, it will not show you. But if you want to ask questions after the lecture and you don't want to be shown on the broadcast, please uh, close your camera. Um, so uh, really have a good year and feel free uh, to write to us with any question or concern or problem that you have so we can help you address it. It's very important in this uh, phase that we can help because there are many things that can be not clear enough. Uh, we'll see you, uh, of course, uh, enjoy today. Uh, it's a very central and important seminar for this program and we're glad that uh, Neta Levy agreed to come and do the opening event with us. And uh, we'll meet again exactly here in this Zoom uh, in, on November 9th for our next seminar that will also be a joint seminar of the Gender and Diversity New MA program and the Conflict Resolution MA program uh, with uh, our Professor Tzfira Kravelsky. And now I pass the platform to Professor Yuval Benziman that will introduce the lecture today and the lecture in more detail. Thank you very much, Ifat. Um, first of all, uh, hi everyone. It's a great uh, seeing you all, even if it's in small boxes. Uh, some of you I see this year because um, uh, I teach you, but some of you, especially from uh, previous year, which I don't see um, every week, it's great seeing you. Um, um, so hi, I hope uh, you'll enjoy, as Ifat said, this year and all together. Um, as if I said, we're very happy to have Neta with us. Um, Neta Levy is a director of policy advocacy at uh, Itach Ma'aki, Women Lawyers for Social Justice. She uh, has been a staff attorney at Itach Ma'aki since uh, 2012 and is leading the project to advance the implementation in Israel of uh, UNSC, United uh, Nations Security Council Resolution 1325 in Israel and the UN uh, Sustainable Development Goals of 2030, which is what she's gonna to talk to us about today. And uh, as Ifat said, I think it's a super important topic um, and I'm really happy that, and I think it signifies something that this is what we start this year with. Um, before, uh, I'm going back to talking about Neta. Uh, prior to joining Itach Maki, Neta was the documentary filmmaker and the journalist. Um, I really advise you to watch her films, which are great. 
Uh, and uh, she worked as a news correspondent and an anchor woman for Channel 10. Those of you who don't know Channel, it's Channel 13 today. Uh, she was an editor in, uh, at the Yediot uh, and uh, was an editor and a correspondent for several radio stations in Israel. Um, above everything else, I think, Neta, I, I hope you'll say it's okay that I'm saying this. She's, she's a social activist. Uh, is that okay, Neta? And uh, she's changing the world uh, through her films and now through Itach um, uh, Ma'aki. So we, Neta will talk to us about, uh, the, the, about Itach Ma'aki and, and, and the UN resolution uh, and the role of women and, and uh, everything. Uh, she will talk for about 40, 45, 50 minutes. Then we'll open it up for questions. Um, if you have questions, uh, please wait till the end. If it's something that was unclear, then you can write to me personally on the chat and I'll look at it and, and I'll, I'll erase it. Um, and then we'll open the mics and everyone can say whatever they want or have questions or anything else. Uh, Neta, thanks again. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Yuval. Thank you very much, Ifat. I already shared my uh, presentation. Do you see it? Uh, 20 years for UN Security Council resolution. Yes, okay, yes. so we can uh, start. Uh, thank you again for having me here. Uh, I must admit that it is a special occasion for me. You will soon find out why. Um, this week, uh, all over the world, uh, uh, people are marking uh, 20 years for 1325 UN Security Council resolution. And I will give uh, global and local uh, look at it. Uh, and, and I'll start by, you introduced me uh, generously, uh, so I will start by uh, uh, talk, introducing Itach Ma'aki. Itach Ma'aki is with you in Hebrew and in Arabic, Women Lawyers for Social Justice. This is the NGO that I've been part of for uh, eight years now. Uh, our NGO advances women's rights in Israel, focusing mainly on uh, women from marginalized communities, among them Arab women, ultra-Orthodox women, migrant women, uh, low-income workers, women living in, in poverty, and more. Uh, we are working on the policy and grassroots levels simultaneously in all of our initiatives, as we in Itach Ma'aki believe that meaningful social change can happen when both shifts occur. Uh, and in this capacity, Itach Ma'aki has been working for many years to advance the implementation of UN Security Council uh, Resolution 1325, which is celebrating, uh, which is a big word, a bit of a sad 20th uh, birthday these days. So we'll start by going back 20 years ago and uh, recalling the basic principles in order to, to make a common ground for everyone who knows or, or doesn't know uh, 1325. The three Ps, the three principles, um, of 1325, participation, women uh, are, uh, according to the, the resolution, demand uh, from all uh, countries that women uh, who are distinctly impacted by war must take an active role in solving and preventing conflicts uh, and in peace building. Protection, it is clear that women and children are uniquely affected by armed conflict. We will talk about this. Uh, this is an important new uh, uh, acknowledgement. Uh, and the prevention of violence, acknowledging women as playing an important role in the prevention and, uh, and resolution of conflict in, and in peace building. Um, the resolution begins with an important context reminder uh, saying, bearing in mind the purposes uh, and principles of the Charter of the United Nations and the primary responsibility of the Security Council under the Charter for the maintenance of international peace and security, meaning this is not a gender equality rights resolution. It's a resolution that aims at solving violent conflicts. Uh, and it is important to remember that and also to, re to remember that this was the first time the UN Security Council ever referred to women or to gender in its decisions 20 years ago. Moreover, the 
the decision recognized the for the first time the grave impact that armed conflict have on women and, and girls, and on the same time, the absence of women from decision-making positions in issues of peace and security. In other words, it realized that the people who are mostly impacted by the violent by, by violent conflicts are the least heard and least influential on the possibilities of ending these conflicts. You see here pictures, random pictures of negotiation tables and signing tables of uh, peace treaties, uh, normalization treaties, as you can see from Versailles uh, 100 years ago, more than 100 years ago through Yugoslavia, a uh, peace board in the caricature uh, where you have the good guys and the bad guys. Uh, and the Madrid Peace Conference, uh, the big um, uh, with the, with a big table with almost no woman around, and the normalization agreement signed a few weeks ago uh, at the White House. Almost no woman, and it is important to remember that even if you can spot one woman, one woman around the table at the table is futile. In business, there are uh, evidence and research that shows that when there are 30%, uh, at least 30% women in decision-making positions, there is, then you can see uh, the change and the difference. So a little bit more background about uh, 1325. It was the outcome of intensive efforts of women's organization, and it followed several international incentives. One was the press coverage uh, of the use of rape as weapon uh, in the war in Rwanda and in Bosnia in the, 19, in the 90s. It wasn't a new weapon, as we all know, but it was the first time the world witnessed that in a, in a way that it couldn't ignore it, I think. Uh, parallel to that, uh, the peace agreement in Northern Ireland was signed, ending a long and bloody conflict, uh, conflict thanks to a major influence of women, the coalition of Northern Ireland women, who were not only a key to getting the peace agreement, but also helped to create a long lasting agreement with articles. They insisted, the women there insisted on adding, dealing with the issue of the day after, after the agreement will be signed, rebuilding trust, throughout education uh, and the need to acknowledge the suffering of the enemy. Um, after the resolution is passed, there, were, there was a lot of research being done on this uh, issue and, and research uh, done that was published in 2015 by UN Women uh, measured the presence of women in 180 Two signed the uh, peace agreements between 89 and 2011. It showed that when women per uh, participated, uh, it's the greatest impact was on the long term uh, of the uh, agreement. Uh, an agreement is 35 more uh, percent more likely to last at least 15 years when women are involved. Another study that uh, uh, looked at 40 cases of peace negotiations, not, not necessarily uh, negotiations that led to peace agreements, showed that women's participation uh, led to uh, a likelihood of reaching an agreement. Uh, women were perceived as trustworthy members of society in these cases, uh, and it helped bring, uh, build public support. Uh, there were more, uh, the, the, um, it also impacted the text of the agreement and analysis of 98 peace agreements between 2000 and 2016 showed that agreements are more likely to have gender provisions when women uh, participate uh, and women's inclusion uh, was associated with higher chance uh, that the agreement uh, will be implemented. Now I want to go dive, dive into several case studies. Um, I want to bear in mind before we do that, that um, it is, I, I often hear when I'm lecturing to Israeli uh, uh, people and to people around the world, many examples of women that did not bring to peace. 
uh, or do not bring feminist or women's rights uh, per perspective to the decision-making uh, tables. So it is important to know and to remember that women's participation is crucial, but it is not sufficient. And now I want to run through several interesting examples from recent years, uh, raising different issues regarding 1325. The first one is Colombia. Um, if you don't know uh, a lot about the, the conflict in Colombia, it is important to know that it was a 50 years of bloody armed conflict with uh, more than 220,000 people uh, who were killed. Almost 6 million people were displaced. Uh, and in 2012, began a new round of peace talks that were considered to be another round of peace talks that uh, no one really uh, thought the, would, would work. Um, and there was only one woman out of 20 negotiators. And, uh, and then uh, women organizations from across the country uh, held a big conference demanding the implementation of the principles of 1325 resolution. And after uh, the, uh, their uh, campaign, at least third, a third of uh, each side was, uh, were women. Uh, another very important thing, thing uh, that was uh, unique about this uh, uh, negotiation process was that it was the first ever gender subcommission that was part of the negotiation team. Uh, and uh, women maintain peace on local level also helped to negotiate local ceasefire and in 2016 an historic uh, peace agreement was signed between the government and the FARC. As you can see in the picture, no women in the picture, <laughs> but there were, uh, there were, uh, uh, it was, uh, there were a lot of women on uh, a third of each uh, part uh, of each delegation were women at least. Um, and I think we need to remember and to ask also ourselves why weren't there were women on that uh, picture. Um, but uh, there was the, the agreement was signed and it was considered in many ways a 1325 agreement. It is not, uh, not everything there is pink. Colombia has failed. Um, Nowadays, there's a lot of criticism that Colombia has failed to uh, implement uh, around half of its gendered provision in the peace accord, and the peace is very fragile. But the women were very influential and uh, considered to be crucial to, to achieve the agreement. The second uh, um, uh, example I want to bring is the Philippines, and here we have uh, a woman, and not only that, Miriam Coronel Ferrer was the first female and the only female until now, uh, female chief negotiator to have signed a major uh, peace accord in 2014. And lately she published a, an article towards the 20th anniversary of, anniversary of 1325 saying that on the ground, do you see the, the quote um, on top? On the ground, many women are working to advance peace and security agendas, but we need to be recognized and visible at the highest levels as well. I think this is something that we need to recall when we'll, go to, when we'll start to speak about Israel, because this gap between many um, peace movements and many peace activists that are female and are feminist uh, peace activists and the gap between them and, the, uh, and their absence in decision-making bodies in these issues is a gap that, that, is not, that hasn't been bridged yet at all, all over the world. Uh, in the Philippines, um, women uh, were 33% uh, of negotiators. Uh, and they were, 20, uh, they were a quarter of the total signatories and served as advisor to both, uh, to both sides, to both delegations. Uh, and they took part in track two and track one process, uh, 
which is something that we see in many peace uh, processes in the last uh, years that um, uh, they started to implement 1325 in track two, in informal peace negotiation. And this is something that we in Itach Ma'aki uh, want to encourage and to implement in Israel also. Uh, next, I want to take a look in, at Sudan. Um, it doesn't really have a connection with the latest uh, news uh, about uh, Sudan and Israel. Uh, I don't know if you know this picture, but it was quite viral. It was uh, the picture uh, of uh, Ala Salah, uh, who on uh, April 10th um, was photographed on a rooftop of a car in the uh, protest against the, uh, the president. Um, the president, the next day, the, the, the picture went viral, as you can see already from the, from the, from the pictures and on all the mobiles uh, taking her photos. And this was uh, the day after that, uh, the following day, the uh, military uh, arrested uh, the president. And it is important to, to, to state that women made up around 70% of the protesters demanding the removal of the president. Um, and this led to, uh, to a gender violent uh, um, uh, action against protests, uh, against protesters. Uh, as you can see, uh, the message officers in Sudan received were break the girls, because if you break the girls, you'll break the men. Um, this was a year and a half ago in Sudan. A uh, soldier arrested women, took them to secret detention uh, sites where they were photographed naked and threatened with sexual violence. Um, after that, they dropped them uh, in front of their houses in order to humiliate them and their families. Husbands began to divorce their wives out of shame. Fathers beat their daughters into submission in an attempt to keep them at, at home. And the last case, case study I want to, to refer to is here in Israel and the Four Mothers Movement. Um, we're going to talk now about, um, in a few seconds, about how we implemented, how Israel implemented 1325 resolution. But uh, the Four Mothers Movement that started uh, in the late 90s, uh, it was it was the movement that, uh, that, uh, uh, that led to the to the withdrawal of Israel from Lebanon. Uh, and what you see here is an illustration uh, from uh, a documentary that was just released uh, uh, a month ago, and is, I highly recommend you to see it. Um, and and the, the documentary depicts the process of how these women started to, uh, to protest uh, and to demand the, the uh, the withdrawal from Lebanon. Uh, they were slandered, of course, uh, treated as naive. And the other thing that is very interesting to mention is, as you can see in this illustration, it's a mother um, uh, pushing a cradle. And uh, the cradle, as you know, in Israel, uh, the boys and the girls are... Uh, uh, it is, it is a symbol of how they, when they, people are referring to the fact that when they uh, um, are born, they are, there is another soldier that is born. Uh, but this is, apart from this, I think it also um, points at a dilemma that I don't think that we can solve on what does it mean? Does every mother have a motherly instinct that, does it have any uh, a direct connection between, between being a female, being a mother, and wanting to promote peace? This hasn't been resolved, and I don't think we will, uh, we will uh, find the uh, uh, um, resolution for that now. But I think that this image is something that I have in mind when I'm promoting 1325 in Israel. Now let's go um, directly to the implementation in Israel in July 
2005, uh, five years after the, the resolution was, uh, was passed, Israel was the first um, UN member to create a legislation based on 1325. It was an amendment to the 51 Equality Women's Rights Law. Uh, with this legislation, Israel committed itself to ensure proper representation of women on all national policy making committees and teams, including peace and, and security issues and peace negotiations. And it also demanded um, representation of women from diverse communities. This is very important and groundbreaking um, legislation in Israel. However, it wasn't implemented. So uh, during the following years and actually until now, Itach uh, Ma'aki and also uh, together with other uh, organizations, we submitted, we're doing a monitoring, a legal monitoring of the, uh, of the implementation of the law. We submitted eight petitions until now uh, to the High Court of uh, Justice. What you see here is a caricature that was uh, published in Haaretz newspaper uh, after uh, we submitted the um, uh, petition uh, in the case of the Tirkel Committee that was established and uh, was supposed to uh, examine the flutilla event and there wasn't any woman there. And the, the reason why it got to, to the caricature in Haaretz is, is because it was the first time that the High Court said, okay, stop the deliberations. You need to add a woman to the committee. You cannot uh, ignore the law anymore. Uh, I must admit that there wasn't a woman eventually. <laughs> and we continued on, uh, on uh, monitoring uh, the implementation. Just recently, we filed a petition against the, the Corona Experts Committee uh, that the National Security Council and the government uh, assigned in, the, in March and April, and there were 23 experts with no woman at all. But uh, petition after petition, we did see an improvement in the representation of women uh, in government uh, um, committees, but it was clear and it is still clear that even if the law will be uh, fully implemented, uh, there isn't a holistic strategy ca that can assure equal uh, and diverse representation of women. And there is no emphasis on the field of peace and security. Meanwhile, around the world, uh, 86 countries already have a national action plan to implement 1325. Uh, including Lebanon that uh, just joined, uh, I think, during the summer. Um, the, um, and uh, some of the countries have a second and a third revised national action plan, uh, national action plan uh, that is also based on more civil society consultation, that is also has a budget. And uh, we realized, when I'm saying we, I mean, uh, women's organizations and civil society organizations. Uh, we realized that Israel government is not going to do that. So during 2012 and 2014, over 30 women's organizations, activists and academics from diverse backgrounds participated in roundtables uh, that and together composed an Israeli action plan according to the civil society. It was something that hasn't been done in in nowhere else in the world. Uh, and in the introduction to the, to the um, action plan, uh, you can find a definition for security that, uh, that these uh, activists and organization wrote together. A security that is based on the notion and the principle of 1325 to see security in a, in a gender uh, perspective. Uh, after uh, we uh, um, after we composed the action plan, we had a big 1325 campaign. We had Ban Ki Moon, the UN Secretary General, greeting us on an international conference, and it was an amazing campaign. And it even led to a landmark government decision on December 14, 14. Uh, the Israeli government uh, committed to create an action plan to advance. 
the principle of 1325. Um, by the way, it doesn't mention 1325 or the UN, which is problematic sometimes for Israeli government to mention in its uh, resolutions. Um, but it did refer to the principles, and in the explanatory part, it refers um, to uh, directly to 1325. It mandated it mandated the creation of an interministerial committee to form a national action plan uh, in line with UN Security Council Resolution 1325. It demanded consultation with civil society organization and to strengthen women's protection from all sorts of violence. We are now almost six years after that, and this resolution hasn't been implemented yet. Actually, it had a timetable of 180 days, which has passed. Uh, but why am I still optimistic? Uh, that's a good question. Um, because uh, there is a gap between, uh, between uh, declarations and government uh, uh, um, uh, advancement uh, and, the gra and, the, and the grassroots. Uh, after the landmark government resolution, uh, we, uh, Itach Ma'aki, together with Women Wage Peace Movement, which I hope uh, you know, if not, I think it's very important to know, and Adam Institute, we uh, held seminars to train 500 women from diverse groups in society in the fields of 1325. Our goal was to give legitimacy, this is how I call it, to women to be influential in peace and security security discourse, but as civilians. And this is something that is very important to me to emphasize here, because in our opinion, and based on uh, the 1325 principles and the 1325 implementation around the world, uh, what is the, 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 um, the main and the most important thing here uh, and tool that 1325 gives us is the legitimacy to, to, to be active and influential and part of decision-making, not as ex-generals and not in order to sound like the general that sits next to me in the in their table that I had the chance of being elected because they needed one woman. No, to, to create a new voice, a gender voice, a human voice a, to conflict and a, to security issues. And, but then we zoomed out or zoomed in and we are here all in the Zoom and we had the COVID-19, we don't, we didn't have, we still have, we're, we're in the middle of that all over the world. And I want to, to do this zoom, uh, zoom in to the COVID-19 crisis as a 1325 case study. Uh, and why is that? Um, first of all, I think this is, well known by now that COVID-19 uh, crisis had a, a grave impact on women, although men are more likely to face <clears throat> health complications from uh, COVID-19. Uh, from COVID-19, women are suffering from uh, uh, more social and economic challenges than men. More women lost their jobs during the pandemic in Israel and around the world. The number of requests, this is just an example in Israel, the number of requests to fire pregnant women in Israel went from an average of 1,000 per year to 15,000 this year, when 90% of them were approved. Um, domestic violence has risen, as you know, with reports of abuse being reported on much a higher level than usual because of tension, because of uh, lack of security and, and socials and, uh, and economic security also, and uh, uncertainties. Uh, during the first lockdown in Israel, there were reports of domestic, domestic abuse centers rose uh, 50%. The UN Secretary General said uh, in the beginning of the crisis that COVID-19 could reverse the limited progress uh, that has been made on gender equality. And um, I want to quote a partner of mine in the 1325 uh, steering committee of our project, uh, saying 
on the first day of the lockdown in, in March, she said the stay-at-home order ignores the fact that women, um, that, that home is not a safe place for these women. For, in Israel, it's more than 200,000 uh, women that live under uh, in violent houses. Um, and uh, women's rights in the beginning and still were neglected and ignored. And the reason was quite clear, as I mentioned in the beginning of April, we found out that the government uh, uh, council appointed an all male uh, experts team. Uh, but there is a, a good, uh, one good uh, uh, outcome of that. We, we filed a petition together with the Rackman Center and on, the, on behalf of uh, 13 organizations. Uh, and after the petition was filed, um, the National Security Council uh, appointed a new, uh, a new committee. And in that committee, there is a majority of women uh, and it is led by a woman. And there is an ultra Orthodox woman and an Arab woman. I must uh, emphasize that in all of our petitions and uh, especially in the last petition, we demanded to have uh, not only uh, that the committee will have more that we have women in the uh, committee, but to have women from groups in society, women that are uh, marginalized and are not heard uh, in decision-making bodies uh, often. And as you also know, uh, a lot of people and a lot of uh, news um, uh, items are talking about the women leadership in the COVID-19 crisis uh, around the world. So. Uh, according uh, to uh, a study uh, that was published in The Guardian a few weeks ago, uh, in, on average, countries led by women were quicker to lock down and had fewer deaths. May-led countries suffered six times more death due to COVID-19 than uh, female-led countries. Um, this is, in the parenthesis, there's an anecdote that as of October, the White House, uh, White House White House staff has more cases of COVID-19 than of New Zealand and Taiwan combined. But it's an anecdote, I must, I must admit. But what isn't an anecdote uh, is a, an attempt, and there are many attempts to try and point at what are the characteristics of feminist leadership in the COVID-19. Um, and I took out some of them. Uh, one that is one that you can see in many uh, research is pointing at the transparency and the uh, in the leadership and the willingness to admit mistakes publicly, and empathy uh, to to people that are now suffering, to people from uh, for from. Uh, um, uh, uh, from, uh, from, from groups in society that are, suffer more, uh, acknowledging that it's a difficult time, speaking to children, by the way, uh, in Norway uh, in March or April, or April, the Norwegian prime minister held a, 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 press, a, a press party to, to children in order to explain to them, they, she realized that they are going through it, they are also suffering as we all know, uh, and setting human security goals as standard. In this table, you can see they are measuring uh, countries that are, um, uh, that have the same population, more or less, New Zealand and Ireland, um, uh, Germany and the UK and Bangladesh and Pakistan. Um, so I, I think, and this is something that you see in many of the research and many of the publication, we cannot uh, summarize uh, still the COVID-19 and the influence of women leadership on COVID-19. We are not at the end of it, but we can uh, seek some of the characteristics. And this leads me back to 1325 and to the question of feminist leadership in general and in the peace and security discourse. What does it mean and are we ready for that? Uh, what you see here in the first picture, uh, this is Margot Wallström. She's, she was the uh, foreign affairs um, uh, uh, minister of Sweden. 
Uh, and she was, um, um, she, by the way, is going to be a guest of us uh, in one of our events to, uh, uh, to mark the 20 years for 2025. So I will be happy to share with you the details, but it's going to be on uh, November 26th. It's going to be our closing event. By the way, this is our opening event of the, of the uh, uh, events uh, marking the 20 years. Uh, to 1325. Uh, and we're going to ask her, what does it mean feminist uh, uh, foreign policy? Because uh, when she got into office on her first or, or second day, she declared that she's going to have a feminist foreign policy. Uh, the years that followed that, she and the foreign ministry of Sweden uh, tried to understand what does it mean? And they published a handbook uh, on on feminist policy, uh, feminist foreign policy, which is exactly the, the core of peace and security, the core of 1325. But I also put this uh, picture. I could find found a picture of Margaret Wallström alone. But this is a this is a um, a part of a newsletter headline uh, that I ran into a few years ago when she was still uh, the foreign minister. And I don't know if you remember, but she got a lot of criticism, not only in Israel. She she uh, acknowledged uh, the state of Palestine. This is why uh, she uh, uh, she uh, she was very much criticized in Israel. But she was also uh, she she was also. Um, uh, she had lots of criticism uh, in Saudi Arabia, uh, where she uh, where she refused to go on with the uh, deliberations uh, uh, until they will resolve uh, issues of uh, gender equality, and and she, she leading this feminist policy uh, was not uh, was not an easy thing was wasn't. Uh, uh, grant, uh, was, wasn't taken for granted and wasn't um, uh, welcome uh, uh, easily. And in this uh, newsletter headline, in the above headline, you see that uh, she's saying, please don't call, don't say that I'm uh, uh, anti-Semitist. Uh, and uh, in the other title beneath, uh, it's a, it's a, it refers to a big article in the in the newsletter uh, in the newspaper uh, that was dealing with the uh, women, young women who lost their boyfriends, uh, soldiers, bo boyfriends who died in the last uh, uh, Gaza uh, war military uh, operation, and about how they are still in con uh, connected to the mothers of these soldiers. And I think that this um, newsletter, uh, newspaper, um, really emphasizes this gap that we still have between how it is we, we women do have the place in the, the in the peace and security discourse to be to suffer from the consequences of of conflict, uh, and this is something that is acknowledged that women. Uh, uh, are, are suffering from it, but whenever they are uh, near a political, um, uh, when they have a political seat and a political uh, position making, uh, a, a decision making position in this field, they are often very much criticized sometimes and often more than men. Um, under the title of feminist leadership, I couldn't uh, not put uh, Jacinda Ardern. Uh, and uh, this was uh, her reaction to uh, the massacre uh, in the mosque. And this was called uh, in newspapers around the world, the hugging uh, policy. Um, I don't have any problem with that. No, uh, no, uh, no doubt it was before Corona, uh, the hugging policy. Now we can't have the hugging policy. This is a problem. And I also wanted to to remind us all, Yuval and all and every and all others here, all other male uh, partners here, that this is not only a job for women. In order to bring feminist leadership, you don't need to be a female. 
uh, and when uh, Trudeau, for example, had uh, 50% of his government uh, with uh, women and said uh, this famous uh, line, because it's 2015. And this is something that is very important. I don't think that only women are feminist and only women can bring feminist leadership. Men can too and should, and it is important. I, and I, and I uh, go back and remind ourselves what is the goal of 1325. It's not to promote, 13, uh, to promote gender equality, but to promote um, uh, conflict resolution. Uh, and, uh, and another way, because I'm speaking to you and the students, uh, I thought it is important to, read, to, to let you know that there are uh, research and uh, uh, all sorts of recommendations. This was just published a few days ago by uh, Georgetown Institute of Women, Peace and Security, call for action to uh, enhance diversity and equality in international affairs education. They have a list of suggestions of how you can do that uh, in your courses in your, uh, in, um, and in your curricula. So when we're going back to, I'm ending now, so I just want to have uh, one last uh, um, look at the global process of 1325. Women continue to be placed around the table and not actively at the table, uh, all around the world. Uh, women are still uh, a minor uh, percentage of, of peace process uh, negotiating teams. Uh, most agreements still don't have gender equality uh, provisions in them, in the um, agreements. And, and uh, as you can see here, only 20%, uh, almost 20% included provisions addressing women, girls, and gender. And there are always the quite frustrating uh, numbers about the global share of parliament parliamentary uh, seats held by women, uh, which is around 24%. Uh, and the average in uh, conflict and post-conflict countries stands on 19%. And, and the global political empowerment gap will currently take uh, 108 years to close uh, if we continue on the current rate. But as I told you in the beginning, I am an optimist an optimist. So I want to uh, end on an optimist note and also to refer to Corona and COVID-19 because we, I do think that one of the positive, if we can say positive about Corona and uh, COVID-19, the positive outcomes of the crisis, of this crisis, is that maybe for the first time the word security was viewed in Israel, and I don't think that it's only in Israel, but I'm working here. Uh, it was referred not only in its militant sense. Uh, women and men from diverse groups in society realized, feeling it on their own flesh and blood, that health security and job security are crucial part of their notion of security. This is a great achievement for Israel. The Security Council uh, uh, that I mentioned before, with, which is a male dominant body of the government for the first time, as I said, has now an expert team with a majority of women and is dealing with uh, health and security and, and, and education and domestic violence and welfare. So I hope that this new definition is here to stay also for our usual crisis times, the conflict that truly needs a human and gender perspective. Thank you. I am here for questions. Thank you, um, Thank you. very, very much. Uh, it's very, very interesting. And uh, um, yeah, I, I have questions, but I, I want to start the students. Anyone here, please, if you have any questions. You can just uh, open your mics and ask instead of me pointing. Anyone? Don't be shy. Nobody is looking and it's not recorded and not live on Facebook. You can do whatever <laughs> you want. Okay. <laughs> Since I am the one that usually does this, um, I think 
or did you in any of your studies did you do did you look at the ambitions of men versus women yes the numbers are skewed but maybe women don't want to go into those positions i mean i think any you've got angela marco you've got margaret thatcher you've got winnie mandela Hillary Clinton, uh, Gilda Mayer, women that yeah. want to do this have been successful. Thanks, Mark. Uh, uh, Mark, can you just say where are you from? The United States. Good luck. Uh, so, uh, Mark, um, actually, I, maybe I will answer that in a personal note. I think that um, for women, in I would I would speak about Israel. Okay, because as I said, we're an organization, we're working, we're not making studies. I quoted studies that I read and, and learned, but uh, we're working with grassroots, with women, with women uh, who are activists uh, from different groups. Uh, and I myself, as, as Yuval said in the beginning, I'm an activist. I see myself as an activist and still I don't go to politics. And most and many, many other women do not go to politics. And this also, uh, one of the reasons also has to do with 1325 and it is the, uh, and it connects to the issue of violence and gender violence against women in politics. And the thing is that when women are close to political uh, positions, uh, are, they are usually, it's not always, but they're usually very much attacked and usually they are attacked below the belt uh, in a sexual uh, uh, manner that, that uh, creates a discourse that makes, uh, that makes it very, very hard for women to join and to do this, uh, this uh, change. I want to refer also to ultra-Orthodox women in Israel. This is something that we, we led a petition uh, to the High Court uh, of Justice uh, against two uh, um, ultra-Orthodox uh, political parties in Israel that are very big political and very influential uh, political parties. And they, uh, by definition, did not have, uh, did not allow women to be members of the uh, party. Uh, and we petitioned against, against their bylaws saying that uh, this is unconstitutional, we don't have a constitution, but this is against gender equality. Uh, and they were often saying real ultra-Orthodox women don't want to enter politics. This is their uh, answer. Uh, and our uh, partners who are uh, ultra-Orthodox uh, ultra -orthodox feminists saying, yes, we do want, but our barriers towards these positions are much, much higher than yours, Neta, they told me. Uh, they are very, they are much higher and we need to, to, to just uh, uh, push, or push aside the obstacles. So I think we have a lot of obstacles, of course, for women from marginalized communities like uh, ultra-Orthodox, uh, but also in general, and this in the beginning, I said that Itach Ma'aki is dealing with marginalized, uh, for, uh, with women from marginalized communities. And I think that in this issue, the discourse of peace and security, almost all women are marginalized. Uh, it is, and in order to create a change, we need a change in discourse. Thank okay. you. Okay. Anyone Thank else? You. Thank you. Thanks. Yes, Oi. Hi, Neta. Uh, thanks for this great talk. Um, I have a question. Here in Israel, we s obviously we want as many women at the table. And in the last, I don't know, decade, we see a few women ministers, such as Miri Regev as Minister of Culture and Transportation, uh, Ayala Chaked as Minister of Justice. But do you see them as, do you see f uh, feminist leadership in in what they do or they're just women and they're ministers and that's about it okay so first of all well, yeah i must ask you where where are you no okay uh, your uh, background is very impressive i will look for it <laughs> well uh, the study doesn't that great in the back trust me <laughs> yes it inspires you to learn 
Uh, I, I must say that I referred to that question <laughs> in my lecture, but I will, I, will, I will refer to that again and maybe elaborate a little bit. Uh, as I said, uh, and it is very important for me to uh, emphasize, and this is a dilemma that we as uh, we, Itach Ma'aki, but many other activists in this field are facing this question on how uh, on whether uh, uh, all women are peacemakers and uh, you, you only need to have uh, to be a mother or to be a woman in order to to want peace and of course i don't think that this answer is that simple uh, and i also don't think that there is a simple answer to your question but i do think that the answer is uh, is by having many and diverse women uh, and in that uh, uh, sense, uh, when we're looking at the government, at the Israeli government, and you have now 34 ministries, ministers, I think, mm -hmm. uh, and six of them or seven of them are women. I'm sorry, I don't remember now, but it's still, it's not half, it's far from half. And when you have half, and when you have half, half around the table, which are women, you'll have women from diverse opinions, diverse backgrounds, and like you have with men. And you'll have uh, men and women that, are, uh, that do promote uh, gender uh, uh, and rights and uh, feminist and, uh, and uh, conflict resolution, and other women that do not. Uh, but you'll have more, and, th and this is what I said, that um, uh, there is this uh, research been done, uh, I, I forgot now the name, but in, in business, in the business sector, saying that it needs 30% in order to make a change, a real change. I hope I answered you. And I also think that it's, I, I will have another addition to that answer, and that that's education. Because I think, I'm a mother to three boys, three little boys, and I think that education to change of discourse is, is a main need in order to change the discourse and in order to allow men and women uh, to, to bring different voices to the table. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, anyone else? Uh, I will ask a question. Uh, Neta, uh, I think we have here um, people that are academically dealing with this topic, uh, Professor Tzvira Gravelsky and I, like the source of objection, why are people so against having women in high status positions? And we also experience this in our organization. And I want to say to Mark that it's not that women do not want to be in these positions, but if you look at some of the <laughs> structures, you will see they're only and only uh, male, and it's not from the lack of want or of abilities of women. So I want to ask why, why, what is this objection? And, and from your point of view, because we, there are theories, social psychology, research, yes. findings, your film, it's Rian, but from your point of view, why, why is that so difficult? And why, if there is a woman, she gets thrown out after a while and there are they find a man to replace her and then everybody feels more kind of, okay, now everything is okay as it should be, your feet, okay, so. Um, I think, um, I, I, I will give an Israeli uh, answer, I mean an, an answer that is relevant for Israel, although I think that it's, I admit that it's not only an Israeli issue, but I think that for us in Israel, uh, the issue of security and defense are very much male uh, dominant uh, and, uh, and the gender perspective and women are seen, are, are seen as not being adequately uh, or not relevant. Uh, and I think this is something that we in Israel uh, are very much uh, aware of because of the dominance of uh, the military in in society uh, uh, and in, in in the market and in and in uh, business and in and in politics, of course. Um, but I do I do think that it is interesting that it's not only in Israel. 
And the, the numbers that I showed at the end of the lecture of only 4% of signatories are women all around the world, it shows that the, um, this, this uh, barricades are, are very, very high. Um, I will give you another uh, example, another answer that, uh, that my uh, friend uh, uh, who is an ultra-Orthodox feminist saying about hair and about uh, uh, hair struggle against the leadership in, uh, in, uh, in the ultra-Orthodox world, it's money. And, uh, and this is where you have the money and you don't want to, and you have, and, and this is why I said before that men are also very much, uh, it is very much important that they will be part of, uh, of this, uh, of the struggle on, on, of this, uh, uh, of, of this way. Thank you. Anyone else? Well, hello, Neta. Thank you for your presentation. It was awesome. Uh, we have seen, like many, in, in many places, many realms to to establish quotas for for women participation. And but in in my impression, in my opinion, many of them we don't don't even reach that quota, and we we try to establish. And many times, the, even the quota is only for numbering, like but some women that are not really representative. I do think that the quota are, are very, very important. It is a, a, an instrument for, for, for allowing women to participate. But what else well, on the structure of society, exactly to allow, for example, those women who want to be there, but socially they are blocked from being there, how Besides the quota, uh, what else could we do as a society or a group? Or, uh, Where are you from, Marcelo? I'm from Brazil. Hmm. Uh, wow, we're all in the same. <laughs> we're all in conflict uh, and and. Uh, Okay, so good luck to you too. Uh, so uh, the issue of quota is a very interesting issue, which I don't have an answer to. In Israel, we don't have a quota. Uh, there are some uh, uh, countries that have a success story with quotas and some that don't. Uh, just recently, the Sudan uh, revolution uh, that I told you about, uh, at the end, they demanded, uh, they achieved to have some kind of an agreement on 40%, but there are still only two out of 11, I think, in the government. So it's, 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 it's a picture that is very complex, like, like you said. Um, and, and, and on the other side, you, you have Rwanda, that has uh, uh, that was established after after uh, uh, a terrible civil uh, civil war that really tore up the country and was almost established from from zero uh, with a quota, if I'm not mistaken. And now they have they are leading uh, in the in the uh, numbers and percentage of women in government and in uh, parliament. Um, I do think that quota is important because uh, I think that it is uh, uh, that that it's a very important tool. I, as an advocate, as an attorney, I feel that when you have laws, even if they like that law I told you about in Israel, even if it's not uh, implemented, we we can we can try and implement it. We can try and, and appeal against it. And 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 I think that quota is a very important tool. I must admit that in Israel, uh, several attempts were done uh, were were uh, done to to uh, to have quota. And not only that, there were even attempts to have some kind of a budget. Um, um, how do you call it? Um, Tamritz, I forgot, uh, like incentive, incentive, yes. A budget uh, a incentive to political parties that have uh, more women, uh, but all these attempts were blocked. Uh, and the reason mainly is the uh, major, uh, it's, it's not only the, it's not the only reason, but the, one of the reasons is the uh, very big, um, uh, um, 
the, the large, uh, the, the influential part of the parties, the ultra orthodox parties in the government and in the coalition throughout the throughout the governments. Uh, throughout th since the establishment of Israel, uh, and they don't they uh, and in these parties there aren't any women. But it is important for me to say that having said that, it's not only an ultra orthodox party's problem. But as I said, in Israel we don't have this. Uh, we, we tried and we didn't achieve that. And I, in general, I think that it is a, an important tool. Anyone else? Um, so can someone else fix it? So I, I'll say something first about, about the quotas. Uh, those who study with me or will study with me, uh, I think that sometimes we look at conflicts as a very bad thing and then we say, we, we, okay, this is how they're resolved. Usually when they're resolved, there are also problems with it. So is quotas everything? It's not. Is affirmative action, uh, affirmative action is that, is it fantastic? It has a lot of problems with it. But I think, and um, not doing anything is worse than everything. So, so we're better off doing things that have problems with them than saying, okay, so the men will continue being, uh, the, the world will continue being ruled by men and because quotas is a bad thing. Um, these are the options. I agree. <laughs> and education uh, is important in order to create. I'll, I'll ask you something. Uh, um, if I understand, maybe I'm wrong in this, but I think that the, that the uh, UN um, uh, Security Council resolution talks about security and peace, and maybe it goes a bit to what uh, Roy was asked before. Um, I think that in some, tell me if I, I might be wrong, but I think that in some countries around the world, it was the way it was also understood is okay, so we are bringing more women to the military, um, which, you know. Not that I'm saying that peace is women and war is men, but the use of it is often not necessarily towards more negotiations. And uh, so if you can say something about that. Yes, uh, it is true. <laughs> this is something that uh, here in Israel is not exactly uh, uh, our uh, need. Uh, maybe some will, uh, will, uh, will not agree with me, but... Uh, uh, it is true that some in many countries, uh, especially in the beginning, um, the implementation of 1325 or one, one of the ways to implement it was to bring more women to police and to uh, military uh, um, uh, service. Uh, and um, actually, I'm in touch with uh, many coalitions of uh, civil society around the world that are working on implementing 1325. Uh, and they are saying uh, that uh, Israel has been uh, uh, their example or to, 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 to good or to bad. I mean, uh, saying that uh, they looked at, uh, uh, that their government said that here we, we will have some, we will implement 1325 like having a, a mandatory uh, um, a military service to women, uh, but this wasn't enough, uh, of course. Uh, and um, there were some cases, like in Nicaragua, in the in the police, uh, that bringing more women to police was very influential because uh, it helped uh, lower the numbers of uh, violence against women. Uh, but in general, uh, I think that in recent years, as I said, the 1325 uh, principles and and the, and the advancers are 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 emphasizing the issue of civil point of view in, uh, in implementing 1325. Uh, and it's not an easy, uh, it's, an, it's not an easy task. I will also, I also want to refer to something that usually I don't deal with because it's, it's not really relevant for us in Israel, but other countries that have 1325 national action plan do deal with is the uh, women in the peace forces. Uh, and women in UN um, uh, peace forces. And this, uh, 
uh, and this uh, uh, issue, first it shows that still there is a very, very low percentage of women in peace forces and that there were research and publications just recently about, how, about uh, gender uh, violence and, 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 uh, and sexual uh, assaults again in, in these camps of uh, peace, uh, um, uh, peace uh, uh, units. Uh, and um, and this is something that the UN also says. This is another way, another place where we uh, failed to implement 1325 by uh, not having it uh, thoroughly in the peace uh, um, um, peace service. How do you call it? <laughs> there are any advance in? women command in police or military groups. Can we observe this worldwide? Or? Sorry, I didn't, I didn't understand what I'm you sorry. said. I'm uh, sorry. Is, is there any advance in like evolving situation of women command in police and military? Because one, one thing is participation. Another thing is women being in, in position of command. High ranking. Uh, yeah, I about the world in globally. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe maybe there is, uh, but I don't think it's in the core of this uh, of this uh, discourse uh, and implementation. But it might be. Um, I I don't have a good answer for that. Sorry. What I, I'll say something from what I know about this, and I'm not an expert on this, but, but from what I know, and I think it has to do with uh, things that were mentioned here before by uh, Neta and by Fat, um, the fact that uh, there are that I know, a military opens all its roles for women is not enough by itself. You have to have a campaign. You have to have the, the men who are still the vast majority and who are in high rank welcome it it's not the numbers are not enough you have to do much more if you really want equality to be promoted yes. so. i want to say uh, if there aren't any questions uh, maybe there are but i will i will maybe i will allow, i will say something that can give some more information about that i said in my uh, lecture i i referred to the um, track two uh, deliberations, uh, which is something that we are now embarking on. We are trying to implement 1325 in Trek 2. Trek 2 is informal, usually, uh, uh, peace uh, negotiations. Uh, sometimes they are confidential, sometimes they are uh, not confidential, that there are more civil society uh, uh, deliberations, but also in this arena, we hardly see women and we hardly see women from diverse communities. And when the only women that do participate in talks with Jordan that are going on all the time, for example, uh, or now the normalizations uh, uh, agreements, uh, about that, I'm not sure, but, but about the the, the recent uh, um, delegations, I'm not uh, I'm not sure. But most of the women are women from a military background, and this is something that is important. And I think maybe it refers to what Mark said in the beginning. Uh, his first question was uh, whether women don't want, and one of the questions were whether women don't want to uh, don't want to be in this discord, they're saying, no, I, I'm not an expert. I don't know about peace and security because usually this discourse is being dictated by, um, by, uh, by military uh, and militant uh, discourse, uh, which is, as I said, is not only in the military. It's not only in the framework of the military, it's also in politics. Uh, so this is something that I think is our goal not only to have more women, but also to enable women to feel that they know and even to learn if they want to learn more in order to, to be able to speak uh, in these issues and to influence in these issues. Uh, and in order to do so, we, we are turning not only to ex-generals, which we have in Israel, we have quite a lot of female ex-generals uh, who also uh, speak about them being neglected and not heard, but 
our emphasis on is on women as civilians that are being uh, impacted by war and that can bring a different voice to end uh, and to to prevent conflict i have something to say if it's okay um, just continuing what you just said neta um even just you know an observation of what happened here in this conversation and the ratio between the amount of women and the amount of women that asked questions and participated in the discussion. So I don't have any question to ask, but I did want to raise another female hand here and say that I enjoyed the conversation. And I think uh, I appreciate the work that Itach Maki, uh, that you guys are doing, you girls are doing. <laughs> And um, yeah, that's it. And, and again, if I had a question, I would ask it. I don't have any smart question to add to the discussion, but I did want to make that observation. Uh, thank you, Ruth. Uh, thank you very much. And I think you're, you're right. Uh, and I think it is, um, this is why we, uh, we turned, uh, we, I told you about the uh, seminars we held in 2016, and this is what we're about to do now uh, in order to implement 1325 in track two and to lay this foundation. We, we know, we acknowledge the fact that we need to uh, have uh, some kind of trainings uh, for women who feel like they want to know more in order to participate, in order to say uh, what they what they their minds and to have a different voice at the table, which is something that uh, I think is important to, uh, uh, you know, there are many research that also say about, uh, that talk about women and the media and uh, people that are saying that uh, from, from within the media and journalists uh, that are saying that when we're calling a woman and we're asking her to come to a, to a, a discussion in the studio, uh, in the news, she will ask me, and she, she will say, I'm not expert on that specific uh, issue. And the men will just say, okay, when does the taxi come to take me? So this is, uh, I think, something that we can't ignore. And I think that uh, one of the reasons is the, the, the uh, feeling uh, of many women that they need to know more and to they need to... Um, to have uh, to to know to have more knowledge in order to speak, um, I, I I must admit that I have a lot of questions myself. It's not like I have the answers to everything. I really really don't. Uh, but I think that these are the questions that we are raising in order to promote this uh, this issue and in order to to bridge over this gap. In my in the presentation, I quoted the Philippine um, and uh, uh, Miriam uh, uh, Miriam Coronel Ferrer, uh, uh, the signatory uh, that was a signatory on the peace accord there, and she she referred to the gap between women who are very active in the field in the grassroots in the issue of peace and security, which is which you can really see that in Israel with the Women Wage Peace Movement and, and other activists uh, throughout history and their absence uh, in, in the decision-making positions. And this gap is something that I, we really want to bridge over. Um, I have a question. Um... First of all, thank you. Yeah, this is something that, you know, it's I'm 100% a personal opinion. I'm curious to hear your thoughts. I wish I could hear every woman in this group's thoughts on it. Um, uh, do you feel um, that women leadership, um, specifically sort of in, directly to what you just said, is it uh, in terms of the, the lay woman, um, you know, in Israel, especially in the last couple of months, there have been a lot of anecdotal cases that have gotten a lot of attention in terms of violence towards women, also during COVID, of course. Do you view women leadership as being the result of women empowerment in a society? Do you think it's the cause? Do you think it's something else entirely that we need both women in leadership positions, but then also we need to do the work in terms of the average woman um, having full access to the culture and society? I'm not sure I understood your question. So you're saying that, can you can you elaborate a little bit and maybe I'll, sure. I'll think uh, about an answer. <laughs> yeah, so basically what I'm asking is the idea of women leadership um, is the idea that first we get women in leadership positions 
and then that is the way towards equality for the average woman or is it we can only get there once we have equality for the average woman or is it just two separate things entirely that don't necessarily over or overlap um i i think that these are two lanes that we need to proceed on and uh and and i think that i think that maybe uh, sometimes when you're reading the research about when women were part of a negotiation uh, process and how they uh, uh they there was a higher uh, percentage of the process to end in an agreement uh, some researchers say okay maybe if maybe they reached an agreement because they had Uh, uh, gender equality and, 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 and maybe the gender equality in this society um, um, was um, uh, was was a um, how do you say it like was a, a condition that was that was uh, that, that was created uh, and that helped no uh, I'm, I'm having troubling uh, uh, re- phrasing that that uh, that in society in societies that enabled to have 30 percent in uh, both sides maybe they were in this uh, they were it was ripe enough in order to do this next step uh, actually there is another interesting um, a quote of uh, this uh, f- uh, Uh, Filipino uh, leader I quoted I will I will look for it for for a second uh, because I think it's very interesting because mm, sorry okay I will look it will take me a, a minute to find it so maybe I, I will uh, sorry uh, the thing is that she she was she was saying that When she led the negotiation as she was part of the majority she was part of the government and she was leading the negotiation with the representatives of the, the minority the Muslim minority uh, of the Moro uh, in in the Philippines and she knew that in order to create some uh, an, an advancement or to advance in the in the talks between majority and and minority you need also to have a Uh, uh, an equal and a parity between women and men. Uh, this is how she approached the negotiation. She thought that when you're leading a peace negotiation between minority and, and majority, and you're talking about equal rights, you have to have uh, equal rights between men and women uh, in your society. And this is something that is it's both lanes, but it, it has an effect. In my opinion, it was a very long, complex answer. Sorry. <laughs> Anyone else? I would like to ask a question. Uh, first Please. of all, thank you, Neta, so much for uh, the informative presentation and for your work in general. Um, I would like to hear your take on this statement. So while I was researching feminism, And I'm taking a lot of classes about feminism. I encountered a lot of people uh, who think that who would say that some they would argue that the problem is violating all of the human rights, not just women's rights. And they would suggest that there should be uh, an emphasis on your experience as a human being, not as a woman in specific. Um, so what's your take on this? Uh, I think this is um, I think I think you're right I think women's uh, rights is part of human human rights and I think that uh, this is part of um, the definition of security in our opinion and when we're talking about a feminist uh, definition of security it's a human rights uh, definition of security. Uh, so I do agree with this uh, with this stand. I think uh, I think this is the this is part of the same thing. Any other questions? I have one statement. Um, I just want to say that I think, uh, 
men and women have different pursuits. And from my experience in all of my education, excuse me, and at this university, Yuval, I think you are the only male mm. professor I have. It's a matter that's, of things. There are more men than women in the university. There are more men than, than women in, as professors. There's more men and women as deans all over the universities in Israel. But uh, sorry, continue. Okay, but my, my point is that uh, I think that it's good that I have women professors that are educating me and I get their perspective of things and it was the same in undergraduate, the same here, same in my other graduate school. So, I, okay, that's it. That's just a statement. Okay. Can I respond to that and also to Rafi's comment? Um, thank you, Neta, for your presentation. I, yeah, I just want to like name and call the like ways in which sexism and racism and any systems that happen across our societies and cultures and are really embedded into the fabric of our education, of our family systems, of our careers. And having a woman, a woman as your graduate school professor, having like one woman on a council is really great and should be happening. And it does not um, mean that the systematic uh, sex that sexism is uh, eradicated by that course. And um, yeah, I've only been in this program for one week so far, but we've talked a lot about like interventions and reforms that need to be happening and electing officials into power while there's um, at the same time that there's systematic change happening in the way we're socialized in our culture, um, the way we're raised. Um, yeah, more to say, but <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Emily and Neta, by the way, both uh, Emily and uh, Marcelo. What is the time at your place? Emily's from Boston now. Marcelo was talking from Brasilia. It's like they woke up for you. I mean, Marcelo wow. woke up even earlier. Wow. Thank you. <laughs> Half past nine, it's okay. <laughs> oh, okay. So it's, it's like evening. Um, yeah. But um, Neta, if, if, if uh, you want to respond to Emily, we have like uh, four minutes to go. So if you want to... Okay. I w maybe I will just uh, I will just tell you a little bit about um, our plans <laughs> for the next uh, couple of weeks. Which, uh, if if you're interested in this issue, I will be very happy if you'll follow us. Um, we decided we is Itach Maaki, but we are not alone in advancing 1325 principles in Israel. And we decided to have this occasion of 20 years in order to reach new audiences and in order to have a big campaign calling the Israeli government to implement 1325 and to have an action plan. So we're going to have a campaign and a video and, uh, and about 30, 30 events, discussions, le lectures uh, with different uh, university academics, but not only uh, on, in, in, on different angles of 1325. Uh, I told you about the discussion with the uh, uh, with the Swedish uh, foreign uh, 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 minister uh, on the 26th of November. Uh, we will have some other uh, uh, discussions that will be held in English, uh, but also discussions in Hebrew for your uh, Hebrew speaking uh, among you. Uh, and I will be very, very happy if you will support, echo it uh, and share it with the people. Um, there will be a, also a discussion in the parliament, uh, which, is, uh, <clears throat> which is very important, despite the fact that the parliament is very uh, un uh, unstable and maybe a week after the discussion, the parliament will, uh, will uh, we will have a new, uh, they, they will declare on a new election, but still it is a very important tool for us to advance 1325. So I will share uh, with you. Um, meanwhile, I, I can share with you the. I, maybe I will send uh, Yuval and uh, Ifat uh, the details in Hebrew and in English about all the events. And you're more than welcome to dive with us into these issues of feminist foreign policy and uh, and and many many of the questions that you rose here. 
Neta, thank you so much. Uh, it was really, really interesting and um, eye-opening. And um, uh, everyone's clapping hands. You cannot hear them. That's, uh, but you have to believe. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, we'll meet again in the next uh, seminar. Ifad, do you want to say something? So, uh, Neta, really, really thank you. It was uh, also touching, moving uh, beyond the intellectual. It was also really, really touching, moving, very involving. And uh, we will really want to stay in contact. So send over information and we'll try to find uh, ways to stay in, talk in contact. And thanks you, Val, for bringing this, for creating this contact with uh, Neta. And... Um, Let's hope uh, for better situations. Yeah, and uh, okay, and we'll meet in the next seminar. Who we'll also will deal with gender issues with Professor Tzvira Gravelsky on November 9th. Okay, oh, thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, all of you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.